Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008. The North Dakota Council on the Arts. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Mosaic, a patchwork of stories about the arts, culture, and history in our region. Hi, I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Danback. On this edition, we'll make German-Russian foods, follow the construction of a double-top acoustic guitar, watch metal become art, and listen to a musician from Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Prairie Public produced Prairie Memories, the Vietnam War Years, in which we recorded oral histories of people who served, were left behind, or protested the war. Marine Corpsman Daryl Frickman recounted the risks taken by field medics trying to treat the wounded under fire. My name is Daryl Frickman. I'm from Elbow Lake, Minnesota, and I was enlisted in the Navy in 19, April of 1968. I was a hospital corpsman attached to the 3rd Battalion, 7th Marines. And we operated southwest of Da Nang, close to the Laotian border. I told my dad I'm gonna enlist in the Navy and I'm gonna ride around in a boat for four years because I didn't want to get drafted and go to Vietnam. Well, the first thing the recruiter asked me was, he said, how would you like to work in a hospital? And I thought, well, yeah, I can do that. I get to core school and then the light bulb was coming on. Now I was learning that that's where the Marine Corps gets their medics from. A medic, they did not have a red cross on their helmet. Not a, no way, that was a target. The sergeant told us, he said, in a combat situation, there's three people they want out of the way first, the lieutenant, the radio man, and the corpsman. You know, so well, thank you very much, because our life expectancy, he said, was about 20 seconds. One thing about it, if you're the, if you're the medic out there, you know, it's, it's hard to treat them because you're getting shot at at the same time. On August 20th first, I was the only one that was put on a helicopter. I got shot by a sniper in Sniper Alley, they called it. And then I was wounded again with some shrapnel. Uh, but that was my ticket out of the bush. You get two Purple Hearts, back to the beer, in the rear where the beer is cold, and you got a bed to sleep in, it's in a shower. The best honor I got was, was 35 years after I was out of the service at a reunion. And when they found out I was a medic, a hospital corpsman, they came up and they shook my hand and they said, thanks, doc. It probably took me 35 years or more before I never talked about it. Somebody asked me something, I said, yeah, I was in sunny Southeast Asia. I never called it Vietnam. It's still there. You know, I can, I can say I, I left Vietnam uh, April 20th, 1971, but Vietnam never left me. Sharing the history of German-Russian culture with youngsters is important to Sue Balcom. She enjoys teaching them how to make traditional German-Russian foods with recipes that have been handed down from generation to generation. Okay, come on up here. This is, this is everybody's favorite part of cooking. Have you ever broken egg before? We are demonstrating to the youngsters in the Napoleon school system how to bake kugan, potato bread, and make some sauerkraut. <laughs> I always like to teach classes where we actually get people involved and into the bread dough and into the kugan dough and hands in the sauerkraut because that's the best way to learn. You guys are excellent. The recipes that I use when I teach cooking classes are from my family. They're traditions that have been passed down from generation to generation. And these children have the same roots as I do and so they easily related to all these wonderful recipes that I've collected over the past probably five years furiously from the generation above me, which will soon be gone. The recipes that were handed down from my great-grandparents to my grandparents to my mother to myself were by something called osmosis. Do you know what osmosis is? It's kind of like a, if I stand next to her, we're exchanging molecules all the time. I spent all my Saturday mornings in the kitchen watching my mother bake. And that's kind of how I learned how to do what I do. I think that somehow between a couple generations, our families have sort of lost a little bit of our German-Russian heritage, which was 
surrounding food. And these kids here are still fairly close to the land, but there are a lot of them that have moved away from here that absolutely have no idea about how important agriculture was and the gift of agriculture and food that the Germans from Russian brought to the state of North Dakota when they homesteaded. Three pounds of cabbage and a teaspoon of salt. That's it. It's amazing, isn't it? It's just like science experiments all over the place. This is how we measure. <laughs> Germans love food. Where I come from, somebody shows up on your doorstep, you just open another can of something and invite them in for dinner because that's how we showed love. Nobody ever gave you lots of hugs. Nobody ever said, I love you all the time. But they sure as heck, if you were well fed, you knew you were loved. I spend time in the kitchen and I invite them into the kitchen also so that someday when they all have families of their own, my grandkids, that they'll be able to say, this is something that my grandmother used to make and she used to make it with love. Technology and steel reflect the artistic talents of Moorhead, Minnesota artist, Carmen Rowe. As a child, she spent her days buying art supplies and digging clay from the Red River to fashion her works. Today, she employs an iPad, a plasma cutter, and a welder to create her artistic dreams. I don't remember a time when I wasn't making art. I've been making stuff since I was a little kid. I remember going to garage sales with, with my allowance for the week and, and trying to buy art supplies and digging clay at the river and making little sculptures and just, just anything I could do, I was always making something. When I went to college, my, my concentration was in sculptural ceramics. I think it was more of a lifestyle change. When we moved out here, I didn't have the wiring for my kiln. And so I, I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna paint then. I just decided, you know, that needs less tools right now. It's, it's easier to set up. I had small children, so I went and just started painting like crazy and just painted and painted for years, I think about 12 years. I've never really understood an artist that sticks with the medium for their entire life just because I'm inspired by so many different things and I'm, I've, I've always had this passion to learn new mediums. This is a piece that I started, um, I guess, it's called Into the Fire. It's about facing your fears. A friend of mine said, you know, we should take this welding class. And I said, yeah, I've always wanted to learn how to do that. I've never learned that. We took one, one course, uh, I think it was one evening. By the end of the week, I had all the tools. I had a, a welder and a plasma cutter, and I was set up. Got my first part there. I love the tools. The fact that you can make something out of this, this flat sheet of steel and cut it down and create this crazy three-dimensional object, that was really intriguing to me. And it kind of um, brought me back to what I loved about ceramics. It was sort of that same way where you could start with this you know, piece of mud or clay and, and build something completely different. This is my favorite tool, the plasma cutter. It's like drawing with fire. Something that painting probably helped with the metal work is the hand-eye coordination. So when I jumped into doing metal and cutting metal with the plasma cutter, it was really easy for me to hold it steady and to, to make the fine lines. A little bit scarier probably than painting because you're working with 30,000 degree Fahrenheit temperatures. <laughs> I don't like using paint so much on metal, so I like using natural patinas or using chemicals to create different colors in the metal versus a paint so you can kind of still see the metal. A lot of times I will think of kind of a theme that I want to build on and uh, like this year I'd say that my, my theme would be kind of uh, change, change and growth. And that's just, just something that I felt when the, the year turned that it was going to be a huge year of change. And so uh, some of the sculptures that I made were, were based on that. And, and so I'll just start sketching on my iPad and sketch out some ideas and not only the basic layout of what the sculpture will look like, but what I think that it means to me. I'm not grinding these all the way down. I'm just giving them a little texture with the, the grinder and smoothing the edges a little bit. I have a big trailer of scrap out here and I, I save most of the scrap from, from other pieces that I do. And, 
they're extremely inspiring to me. So a lot of times I'll dig through that and see if there's any of the shapes that, that are striking me at that moment that would go with this piece and, and then I'll kind of go from there. This is where I like to add a lot of dimension. So I'll, I'll get some metal pieces and suspend these up off of this a little bit. I didn't do commissions until about two years ago and I had a customer come in to the gallery and liked my work and really wanted me to make something for her. And it really put me out of my comfort zone. It's not something that I usually like to do ever. <laughs> so I immediately gave her the card of another artist and she said, no, I really, I want you. You know, I like your work, I want you to do it. And so I finally said, okay, I'll do one commission and I'll see where that goes. And if it's horrible, I'll never do it again. And and actually probably about 85% of my work is now commissioned work. <laughs> it's been fantastic. It's really pulled me in directions that I probably wouldn't have gone on my own. Um, definitely took me out of my comfort zone, but I'm getting more comfortable learning what the customer wants and trying to create you know, what they see in their head. And some of them have a real rigid idea of what they want. Others say, you know, this is the size I want, come up with something. Those are the most fun. I wouldn't say I'm the cleanest welder either. I just kind of want to make it stick. I don't care if it's real pretty underneath there. Nobody's going to see it anyway. MSUM now. It was great to go back there and work with them. And they were doing a remodel on their Nemzik building and wanted a, a four-foot dragon, which is their logo for their athletic department. It was basically uh, just a dragon. I made it uh, three-dimensional so the the back and the head were, were separate pieces and then I had to light both and the flames that were out of the mouth I kind of heated to create like a, a gold color on it and it was just a really fun fun project and it's a, in a really neat space that they've built over there. The metal goes to um, kind of a gold and then a blue and then a purple depending on how long you leave the heat on. I hope to stay with metal for a long time. I really, really love it. You know, if I had the right studio set up, enough room to do my metal and paint and ceramics, I'd probably be working in all the mediums all the time. <laughs> Kevin Miterman is a reconstructive plastic surgeon by day and a guitar maker by night. After medical school, Kevin decided to learn more about guitar building and trained with master builders in Massachusetts. By combining materials like carbon fiber with wood and traditional guitar building wisdom, Kevin creates double top acoustic guitars that are as technically brilliant as they are beautiful. There isn't a single moment when I'm in here making guitars that isn't joy. I'm Kevin Miterman and I'm a guitar maker and I've been doing that for about 18 years and I'm also a plastic surgeon in town. I've uh, been a guitar player since I was about nine years old. Uh, for some reason, the tone of the guitar, first time I heard a guitar played well, it just uh, thrilled me to no end. Since I was uh, quite a young person, I've always built things. And when I was in high school, there was a guitar maker there. He had a guitar store where he would sell regular guitars, Martins and Taylors and all those things you hear about. The guitars that he was making sounded better, intrinsically better, and I wanted to know why. Then I went off to medical school residency, but then when I started my practice, I decided I wanted to recapture some of these things that make life special. And so I uh, would take my vacations from my, my job and I would go off for, say, a week or two at a time to a guitar making school in Massachusetts and work with these master guitar makers. And once I'd learned what I needed, I, I started building uh, guitars myself and I've been doing it ever since. It's meditative. People ask oftentimes how this relates to surgical uh, skills and surgical training. And I think that it really is very much the same. In other words, my my uh, joy for working with my hands, I suppose, came first, and it manifested in my job, which is surgery, but also my working with, with wood. And surgery is, I love doing it, uh, but there's an intensity to it, and this is sort of the antithesis of that intensity. It's peaceful and is completely without tension. 
and that's lovely. And so once the shape is determined, then you determine the woods you're going to use. And sometimes that's a purely aesthetic choice. Sometimes uh, certain players want a certain wood for a certain tone. So, you, so I kind of get all those things, literally put them on the bench and, and start designing when it's just raw, rough hunks of wood. This is where all, everything begins. I buy the wood in a rough form. Uh, for example, here's some East Indian rosewood that still has the, you know, the saw cuts on it from the mill. Its mashing sides are here, and these are also rough, but they'll be eventually thinned on the sander and then bent into, bent into their, their shapes. And so uh, I used to have only two shapes of, of guitar. I now have collected uh, you know, eight or ten different uh, uh, sets of, of, of work boards. So here's how the neck begins, a big hunk of wood. But then at some point you get down to just whittling it basically. These are little surgical lights that I bought from a surgical supply house. I also learned that in the operating room there are always two lights, one over each shoulder, so no matter where you're working, you're eliminating the shadow. And so when I'm working I'll often use my two little lights and I'll have one light coming over each shoulder. And so no matter where I'm working, there's, there's, never, there's never a shadow. And that makes for some great detail work. It's fun to see as you start scraping back, bringing the woods level and getting the glue off of there, it's fun to see the, the lines pop. This is, this is uh, rosewood and this is poplar, and it's fun to see as you're scraping the result poke through. And then I assemble the back to the sides and I have uh, the first step. And then I start on the top. I choose those woods. All right, so this is the way I make my tops using the composite materials. So traditionally, a top for a guitar, which is the vibrating element of it, comes out of a single book-matched set of wood. These days, people are using composite materials to try to get a guitar top that is as resonant and is as strong, but is actually lighter, so you get more sound and maybe even more controllable sound. From the audience perspective, no one would know there's any difference. For example, this is a double-topped guitar with all the composites and all the fancy things inside the guitar, but you'd never know it. All guitar tops are not just a piece of wood, but they're braced somehow on the inside with, with a series of, of braces. Uh, traditionally, these are solid wood. I use a little thin sheet of, of carbon fiber. Sandwich that between two thin pieces of wood, and you get a brace that is inflexible because of that that almost like an I-beam on the, on the inside. It's very strong. If I get a request from a, a guitar player for something, uh, I'll work it up in a prototype first so that I can change one element at a time um, to try to hone in on the sound that they're looking for without having to build a whole new guitar. So, there's a six string. Here's a 12 string prototype. This is a Nara wood guitar. Got a really big sound. I look forward to coming in here at the end of a long day. I guess I'm sort of a, a geek. In other words, I don't do much besides my work and spend time with my family and then make instruments and plan guitar concerts. It's really a good life. Uh, it's a simple life, but it's, but it's mine and I like it. David Stoddard is a teacher and songwriter who has performed acoustic music throughout the U.S. for years. He has a passion for house concerts because of the intimate atmosphere and personal connections. His original music is quirky and sometimes humorous, but with a clear message or opinion. And a quarter gets one You could say it in rhythm It's just one, two, three, one And it's easy to hear it 
It's truth rendered in sound. It's an easy surrender and it's paradise found. It's three quarter time that's a comfortable groove. It's the way we exist, it's the way that we move. <laughs> Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, and the music of love is in three quarter time. Harder for children, cause it's so seldom heard. And popular music is rarely preferred. But for grown ups, it's easy. It's the essence of art. Something primeval, it's the sound of your heart. It's three quarter time, that's a comfortable groove. It's the way we exist, it's just the way that we move. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, and the music of love is in three quarter time. There was a time that I was four to the bar. But you gotta keep moving, you just know how we are. There are difficult changes, impossible rhymes, but my memories of you, they're all three quarter time, they're all three quarter time. That's a comfortable groove, it's the waltz of existence, it's the way that we move. Parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, and the music of love is in three quarter time. Most of my songs aren't about me; they're they're sort of characters, and, and I try to find out where that character is coming from. I try to get a snapshot of a feeling sort of a, an emotional moment sometimes is what I call it and, and you try to explore that with with either metaphor or examples there's a song that that's called Dakota Girl it was about somebody that loves winter and it, incidentally it was booted out of a contest because they thought no one would ever believe that such a thing could be possible <laughs> Dakota girl loves winter time and she longs to hear the wind around the door. And she'll stay up till the fire is out just to feel her icy feet upon the hardwood floor. She cherishes this time alone and she'll wait until the sun is gone and never feel the need to light the light. And it's windy, and it's cold, and it's dark And she's alone, and she's never felt as grounded as she feels tonight And outside the wind becomes a stream That slithers in that gap between her clothes Tickling on her hidden skin like water trickling down until her legs are froze. With open arms she starts to float, she welcome with an open coat to twirl around and take the coolness in. And she's opened all the mysteries out floating on the slightest breeze and winter is the water. That she's floating in and Some people have a passion That their summer-loving sisters cannot know 
Summer lovers cannot understand the beauty of all the diamonds on the coldest snow. And the wind will make her tears to come And for a moment when her cheeks are numb the stars are brighter than she's ever seen And the way out there is just black as tar Clear out to the furthest star And she's closer now to heaven than she's ever been Dakota girl loves wintertime And she longs to hear the wind around the door She'll stay up till the fire is out Just to feel her icy feet upon the hardwood floor If you know of an artist, a topic, or an organization in our region that you think might make for an interesting segment, please contact us at Prairie Mosaic at prairiepublic.org. I'm Barb Gravel. And I'm Bob Danback. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Prairie Mosaic. Prairie Mosaic is funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4, 2008, the North Dakota Council on the Arts, and by the members of Prairie Public. <laughs>